a series on selfishness. The title of the series is um, that I've that I've been on is that this is going to cost you your life. And then I took a week to rest my voice last week. Bobby brought a powerful, challenging word about uh, don't take a chance in uh, how we need to live a life that's transformed by the gospel. And then this week, before I jump back into my series on dealing with selfishness, I felt like that the Lord had something else that I was going to minister in December, but I felt like he said, do it now. So I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so we're going to continue one more week into, uh, before we go back into the series on selfishness. Plus, it's not bad to take a little bit of a breath because the, uh, the word's been coming so strong lately. We need to pull our toes back out a little bit and, uh, and remind ourselves that even as God wants to change us and transform us, it's because he loves us so much. Um, so I want to ask you this question. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like you weren't being taken seriously enough? Y'all ever been in a situation where you felt like you had something to offer? Uh, maybe, maybe you, uh, you were in a situation where you, you were able to contribute to the conversation, but the people that were there weren't taking your advice. They weren't taking your counsel. They were looking maybe down on you. I think about the story of, of Paul speaking to Timothy whenever he said, don't, look, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Uh, Timothy was in a place where he was speaking and evidently people were not taking him seriously because of his age. And Paul's like, don't let that intimidate you. You have a voice. You have something to say and you've got to get it out there uh, it, even though the people aren't taking you serious. I'm going to dive into something right here. I've in, in sitting down with some, uh, some of my African-American friends. There's a lot of times that they feel like that they're not being taken seriously just simply because of the color of their skin. And, and so there are situations and times that we get into that we have something to contribute, but it feels like our voice is being limited by either other people's prejudices, other people's thoughts, or because we have done something to silence our voice. But it drives me nuts whenever I get into a situation and I feel like I'm able to contribute to it, but nobody wants to listen because of whatever's going on. Um, a lot of times whenever I visit with people, that's one of the things that comes out is that uh, they want to be heard. Do you want to be heard? Yes. Do you want to be heard in your marriage? Yes. Do you want to be heard by your kids? Yes. When you're an employee at a work job, do you want to be heard by your, by your boss? Uh, I remember when I was in college, I had a, a, a good opportunity to work for a, uh, a manufacturing plant. It was called Chamber Door. I don't know if y'all remember that. Uh, for those of y'all been living in Hot Springs for a long time, I, I worked for this company called Chamber Door, and it was our job to make these uh, uh, storm doors that uh, people would put on their houses. And so uh, during the summer, I'm standing on an assembly line and I've got a screw and a, and a gun and I'm just uh, making these deals where the people who are the, the white callers, they're up in the main office. And I don't know that for one day of their life, they had ever been down on the floor actually doing what we were doing. And they were dreaming up all of these things for us to do. And they would come down and they're like, well, you need to do this, do this, and do this. And we're sitting there going, that's not going to work uh, because we know how things are operating. And so we would try to talk to them and say, this is what usually works. And the reason why we think we need to modify what you're doing they didn't listen to us. And sure enough, a few weeks later, they're wondering why they're behind on their orders and the doors are falling apart. And we're like, because we're the ones down here actually doing it and we understand what's working and what's not. But we didn't have a voice. And the not having a voice was so frustrating. Any of y'all ever been frustrated because you felt like you didn't have a voice and whenever you would try to speak, somebody wasn't listening? <laughs> That's, there was a good amen right there. That's, um. <laughs> I'm not going to dive into that one. So we got with our spouses. We got it with our kids. We got it where we work. Um, that's what I want to talk about today. I feel like that the Lord's wanting to talk about our voice and about how easy it is to lose our voice. Believe it or not, I feel like the Lord was stirring this in me way before I actually lost my voice. And, uh, and you know, some of y'all have been knowing for the last three or four weeks, I haven't been able to sing very much. I haven't been able to speak at the level that I've been speaking at. It's so frustrating to lose 
your voice and not be able to communicate. And so the things that happen in our life, a matter of fact, I want, I want to use an example here. I need for Jason Mohan and Michelle Lusher to come up here, please, for just a second. You're welcome. Jason's like, dude, give it. <laughs> come on, man. I got you. I love that guy right there. This is Jason Mohan. He's one of my friends. This is Michelle Lusher. Known her for a long time. And a uh, matter of fact, so much of the media stuff that you're seeing, she's, over, she's overseeing. And the new website that's about to come out and all these things. All right. So many of you may not realize, Jason has a tremendous amount of gifts and talents. Uh, if you ever get to know him, you will be blown away with the things that he does. For a long time, he was a bricklayer. Uh, he could do foundations. He could do brick. And, uh, and he's really good at it. Now where his expertise are in areas of phlebotomy, if you don't know what that is, don't even try to spell it because I can't help you there. Uh, he also works with machines that read uh, people's blood samples that come through. And he has gone to school and is educating himself. And so, uh, so there's a lot of different areas where Jason has expertise. So today I want to focus on the expertise of bricklaying. All right, so Wes, let's say that you are about to build something at your house. And you don't know how to put the brick up. You don't know how to get the foundation laid. And here's Michelle. And so you, you know Michelle. She's really good at so many things. And so you have these two people right here. Whose voice do you want to hear? You know, this, this is one of those answers that I, I appreciate the fact that you answered that. All right. But now, Wes, you have a different problem. And the problem is, is that you were trying to set up a social media uh, deal where you need to use Snapchat. You need to use Instagram. You need to be able to reach a whole bunch of your customers through a whole different way of being able <clears throat> through social media, whether it's Facebook. Which of these two are you going to go to? You'll be going to Michelle because that is her area of expertise. It's because the voice that they have in those areas has influence for those areas. You see, what we really want to be is we want to be a people of influence. We want to have influence in our families. We want to have influence in our workplace. We want to have influence in the things that we do. And so whenever we find somebody, if I need to know anything about laying brick, this is the man that I'm talking to. I love her. I'm not talking to her because she doesn't have influence in that area. But if I need something in the social media or website realm, I love him, but I'm not going to him because she has influence in that area. We all thank you so much. We all want to have influence in the areas of our lives. And, and so being a person of influence, we have to make sure that our voice can be heard. We have to make sure that we have the way to be able to communicate, to speak, to allow our voice you see, the way that they have lived their lives has affected their voice. The way you live your life, hear this, the way in which you live your life will affect your voice. And if you want to be a person of influence, you have to have a life that backs up the ability to have that influence. Because if you're living a life that's contrary to the influence you want, you, you, want, you won't have that influence. And so one of the things that the enemy wants to come do is, do is he wants to attack your voice. He wants to attack your influence so that he can keep you marginalized and on the side. So if you're living in a way that inhibits your voice, you can no longer stand up and proclaim the things that you would like to proclaim. There are people who want to be taken seriously, but they're not. Sometimes that's because the people don't have ears to hear. That happened to Jesus. He was a person of influence that sometimes people didn't hear him, but that's because it wasn't a Jesus problem. It was a hearing problem on them. There are some people in your life that they can't hear what you're saying, and it's not because of your voice. It's because of their ability to hear. But my sermon today isn't about that. My sermon today is about what are we doing that's hurting our voice in people's lives? What is the church in America doing that is destroying its voice in this nation? What are we doing that is destroying our voice in our families? What are we doing that's hurting our ability to communicate and affecting our ability to influence the things that are going on in this nation? It's hard to affect an, a nation for the gospel when we look just like it. It's hard to affect a nation to come out of their sin when we're doing the same thing that they are. It's hard to proclaim righteousness whenever we're filthy, dirty rags ourselves. It's hard whenever we look just like the world to have a voice to tell it it needs to change. Wow. Whew. 
How can we influence this world? How can we have a voice? We need to ask the Lord, where is it that I need to address my voice that it could be heard better? There are some killers of having a voice. Um, and this is where I like to show that video. And, and to, to, while you're pulling that video up, please, I, I'll give you a little background. This is one of my favorite Disney movies. I have a lot of favorite Disney movies. This one is The Little Mermaid. And the story of The Little Mermaid is that Ariel uh, is, a, is a mermaid. Shocker, it's in the title. And she, uh, is, she has fallen in love with a human. And she wants so bad to have human legs that she can walk on the beach and she can uh, go and experience all the things. Uh, and, and some of y'all could even sing the song uh, that, that goes along with it because whenever we watched it as, as kids or as teenagers or even as adults, we, there, there was this thing about the music that it just like it caught you up in it. And you're pulling for Ariel to be able to have her, who's, who's her prince? Prince. Thank you so much, ladies. I could hear y'all way over the men's voice. Men, I'll give you a pass on that one. Um, and so, so she is willing to do anything, anything to be able to become a human that she might be able to have what it was that she wanted. And so as Ariel tries to figure out how she can become a human, she turns to Ursula, the sea witch, to see if Ursula can help her. And so in the process of Ariel describing what she wants, Ursula begins to sing this song. And if we're ready, let's roll it. Cross a bridge by sweet, you've got to pay the toll. Take a gulp and take a breath and go ahead and sign the scroll. Got some checks and now I've got her boys. The boss is on a roll. This poor unfortunate soul. All right. Thank you. Who was over here singing that song? I heard it. Somebody's over here singing it. There was a bunch of y'all that were singing it. That's awesome. There was a line in there. I don't know if you picked up on it. She, she said this. It won't cost you much. Just your voice. I remember watching that one time. I'd watched it as a kid and it jumped, didn't jump out to me. But I watched it once as a parent. And, and I saw the, and I heard that line where, where Ursula was saying to Ariel, this won't cost you much. This compromise in your life, what it is that you are after, what you are willing to give up to get what you want, it won't cost you much. It'll just cost you your voice. There are some things that we would like to have in life, some things that we would like to do in life, some things that we would like to experience in life. And it's not going to cost you very much. Just your voice. But I want to have this lifestyle and my friends, they get to do this and, and my kids are living this way and it seems like there's no consequences and everything seems to be going good. And we watch what they're doing and we think, I would like to have that and it won't cost me much. But it will cost you your voice. It will cost you influence in people's lives. Because whenever it comes time for you to be able to speak into their lives, when it comes time for you to be able to help them through what they need to go through, when it comes time to promote the gospel, they're going to know that we were living in compromise. We can get up here on the stage and we can lead worship, but they know who we are when we're off of the stage. And they are wondering, how can you be up on the stage when you're living just like me when you're off the stage? How can we lead them to a closer relationship with the Lord when we have ruined our voice? voice in front of them by the way we live outside of this place. You can have the life you want to live and it won't cost you a whole lot, but it will cost you your voice. And then the wages of sin is death. The, also, the word says that God will not be mocked. That which a man sows, he will reap. If he sows to the, uh, to, to the spirit, he will reap eternal life. But if he sows to the flesh, he will inherit a whirlwind, he will inherit destruction. I want to throw out some names to you. Any of y'all ever heard of a guy by the name of Jimmy Swagger? What happened to his voice? 
for those of you that might be a little bit younger, because I was, I was pretty young whenever this was going on, but Jimmy Swaggart was probably the number one televangelist on TV. He had uh, so many people tuning in to listen to him preach. People were flocking to his church to be able to, to see his ministry. And it came out that he was uh, visiting a prostitute and it was, it was being shown around the whole world. And so it affected his voice. And so he gets up in front of the church. He gets up in front of the cameras. He gets up in front of everybody with a microphone, tears running down his face, begging everybody for mercy and please have grace. Please forgive me for what I've done. And, and so he was able to stay in his position of power. He was able to stay in his position as a pastor only to find out that he was still going back and continuing to visit that same house. And he, he, had, he was continuing to live in that, that sex inn. And it eventually... Uh, pulled apart the whole ministry that he was in. Have you ever heard of a guy named Jim Baker? It's another one of the famous ones from the 80s that was uh, in tax evasion and doing pro uh, things with finances he shouldn't be doing. And whenever it came out, he got busted. I'm about to jump into something, so take a breath. Let it out. Thank you. Um, there's somebody else right now that's current that is doing some things that has caused... Unemployment to go down to almost record lows. Somebody who has made agreements with other nations to, to cause our uh, trade deficit to be able to, uh, to not be so bad and who's done so many things to, to help in our economy. But every time he sends out a tweet or every time he puts something out on social media, it completely undermines everything that he's doing in the realm of the finances and everything he's doing for, for our nation because he is running his voice with the things that are coming out of his mouth. And y'all know who that is. That's our president. Pray for him daily. Lift him up before the Lord. Ask God to give him counsel and guidance and to help him whenever he needs to shut his mouth to shut his mouth. It's just the way it is. Nobody's talking about the good things that he's doing. Nobody's talking about the things that are going on and, and we want to blame it on, uh, on the media. We want to blame all this stuff. But what's happening is he's killing his voice because of the things that he's saying. And so the influence he could have, he's undermining because he's saying stuff he shouldn't be saying. I'm not trying to get political. I'm not trying to tell you who to vote for. I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. I'm just telling you that even with your best intentions, and you can be doing so good in so many areas of life, and then you let these compromises come in, it undermines everything that you've done. Whenever you work so hard to get a good reputation and to build, build up your name, in the, whether it's in the community or the church or before the Lord, and then we just allow these areas to go on, and it just takes our voice away. We want to be people of influence in our families. We want to be people of influence in, in our workplace. We want to be people of influence in this nation. Bring somebody else out. A guy by the name of Billy Graham. You think he had influence? Do you think he had a voice? He had such a voice that whenever he showed up in England, the Queen of England said, I want to clear my calendar because I need him to come sit down. Because when he opens his mouth, a fire burns inside of me that wants something different. He had a voice, but he had a life of integrity that backed up his voice. So when he spoke, the queens of nations listened. When will the church get our voice back? When will we be able to speak to the things of this nation and to say, no, there is a better way and His name is Jesus. Let's follow after Him. And people see that there's a difference in us and say, yes, we want to follow. Let's get our voice back. Let's get our voice back. And to say, God, would you please restore the voice of your Holy Spirit and your holy people. Raise up the saints. Because right now what we're doing is we're like putting duct tape over our mouths. Whenever God's wanting to give us a megaphone to be able to speak to this nation and this world, it won't cost much. Our compromises, they don't cost much, we think, until we have no more influence in our families, no more influence in our workplace, and most of all, no more influence in His kingdom. Thank you. The book of Exodus, there was a man by the name of Moses. Whenever God said, I want you to go declare to Pharaoh to let my people go, Moses said, I don't have a voice. I'm not very good at talking. And God said, I'll go with you. I'll put my anointing on you. I'll give you a voice. There's somebody that we know very, very 
familiar with through Scripture. It's a guy by the name of Samson. He was a judge. He was called to deliver the people of Israel from the oppression of the Philistines, right? And so he was told, don't drink alcohol. He was told, don't touch dead things. He was told, don't cut your hair. And he drank alcohol. He touched dead things. And eventually he cut his hair. And so he was a man who was gifted with the ability to deliver the people of Israel from their oppression. But because of his willingness to compromise the things that God told him not to do, there came a time that he found himself blind, bound, and in captivity. And he lost his voice. He, maybe not his physical voice, but he lost his ability to deliver his people. God had anointed him and called him to be a judge and to deliver the people. But because of his compromise, he lost that ability until he found himself bound to some pillars, blind because his eyes had been gouged, up, gouged out. And he was in captivity to the very people he was called to deliver his people from. Compromise eventually made him captive. There's another story in the book of Acts chapter 19, if you want to write that one down. Book of, uh, book of Acts chapter 19, verse 3. Got it on this one right here. In the book of Acts chapter 19, verse 3. Am I in the right place? I don't know. It's, a, it's talking about, uh, oh, maybe that's 13. But anyway, it's this group called the Sons of Sceva. And it says that these Sons of Sceva, their dad was a priest. He was a leader in the church. And they decided that they wanted to go around and, and cast out all these demons because they had seen Paul do it. And it was this really cool show because these people are like screaming and foaming at the mouth. Pea soup is like coming out. Anybody ever seen anything like that? And so there's all this, de this deliverance that's taking place. They're like, oh, we want to be a part of that. So they're going from person to person. And there's like, in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul, Paul, be set free. And so they come up to this one dude who's just, I mean, I don't know what possessed people look like, but I guess it's like that. And, and, so, and so they come up to this one guy and they, and they say, in the name of Paul and in the name of Jesus, be set free. And all of a sudden a demon voice comes out of this body and says, I know Paul and I know Jesus, but I don't know any of you guys. And the spirit that was inside that dude, the guy became the Hulk and he jumped on all of those guys and beat them up, ripped their clothes off and they went running out naked and scared to death because of what had happened. Here's the thing. Did Paul have a voice? Yes. Did Jesus have a voice? Yes. Did those guys have a voice? No. And they left defeated because they didn't have the voice to be able to speak to that. They didn't have the influence in that area. There are those of us that we want to have influence, but we have to make sure that we have the voice to back it up. Do we have the voice? I'm going to talk to you just in a little bit of having the voice and getting the voice back if you've lost it. There's a guy by the name of Zacharias. And uh, this isn't the wee little man that climbed up in a tree that was Zacchaeus. This is Zacharias. Uh, he and his wife had been crying out to God for a child. And finally, in their old age, they had been told, uh, you're going to have by an angel, you're going to have a, a baby. His name's going to be John. He is going to be the forerunner to the Messiah who is coming. And Zacharias kind of laughed it off. He was like, I'm too, I'm too old to have kids. You see my wife, she's kind of old too. And she can't have any babies. And so this is funny. And so the Lord said, as a sign of your lack of faith, this is what's going to happen. Anybody know what happened? He was, he lost his voice. He wasn't allowed to talk until John was born. God wants to give you a voice, not just in your workplace, to give you a voice and not just in your house. You see, so many times we want to focus everything like my sermon for the last few weeks has been about. We want to focus about us and, and our kingdom. But, but the truth is that God doesn't just want to give you a voice so you can have a better work environment. He doesn't want to just give you a voice so that you can have a better home environment. He wants to give you a voice that will affect the nations of the earth for his kingdom. He wants to give you a voice that the principalities that are over the city of Hot Springs, they know who you are because you have a relationship that is so close with the Lord and so close with your Heavenly Father that when you pray, 
the, the heavens know. The, and the devil says, oh no, Debbie Whitney's on her knees again. We should be afraid. That whenever they know that you've begun to worship, they say, oh, get ready because it's coming down on us. Because Trinity Church has begun to worship this morning. We need to have a voice in the, in the places of the spiritual realm. Not just so that we can have a good work environment. Just so that we can have a good home environment but that we can actually change the course of this nation. And we do have a voice in the way that we vote, but I'm telling you, what changes this nation is not laws that are passed in Washington, D.C. It's the Holy Spirit affecting the hearts of man. And so what we've got to do is that we've got to have a voice that affects the hearts of men. We can't legislate that. Do we need to vote and send godly people to represent us? Absolutely we do. But what God's got to do is change the hearts of man. And how is he going to do that? He's chosen to do that from his church. In Trinity Church, my family, I'm telling you, let's get our voice. Let's speak it from the mountaintops. Let's change the course of this city. Let's change the course of this state. And let us change the course of this nation. Because when we get our voice, the heavens will know, the demons will hear, and things will change. Amen. Book of Acts chapter 2. Book of Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. If you want to mark specific verses, it's verses 6 through 8. Um, Peter, the Holy Spirit's just fallen. Tongues of fire on their heads. Wind blowing through. It says that they were speaking in other languages, speaking in tongues. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 6, And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because they were each one hearing the disciples speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that we hear them in our own language? What happened was, these were Galileans. They were known as fishermen. They were, they were known as kind of lower class, not very educated. You don't take them seriously. They didn't have influence. But when the Holy Spirit fell on these Galileans who were uneducated, they were weak, they were stupid, they were, they were not supposed to be knowing all these other languages. They didn't know what they were talking about. But when the Holy Spirit filled them, the people were filled with amazement and said, they shouldn't be this powerful. They shouldn't have this kind of influence. What has happened? And they gave glory to God and that number, 3,000, that day 3,000 were added to the number that were following the Lord. I'm ready to get my influence I want to be a person of integrity that can back up what my words are saying. Because how can I get up here and say what I'm saying and then go live something different when I step off of this pulpit? I have got to back up my words with my actions. These people, they, they honor me with their mouths, but their hearts, they are far from me. How can I affect my family, if I am living in compromise and my kids are watching me say things I should not say, watching me watch things I should not watch, watching me do things that I should not be doing, and then I'm going to tell them that they're supposed to live a certain way, you've lost your voice if you live like that. We have got to be a peculiar people that rise above the temptations and the drag downs of this world that we would live at a place, not perfect, saved by grace. There's faith and grace. That's the only way I'm going to make it. But at the same time, I cannot lose my voice because I'm unwilling to repent of my wrong ways and follow after him. I know I was going to get this fired up. I heard somebody say one time, if there's no fire in the pulpit, there'll be no smoke in the pews. So how do you get your voice back? Let's use Samson as an example. He lost his voice. Some of you can say, Matt, I've made some mistakes and I'm afraid I will always live with the consequences of those mistakes. Matt, I've done some things and I've lost my voice with my family. I've lost my voice at work. I'm afraid I've even lost my voice with God. The good news is that you can get your voice back. Y'all, you can get your voice. The church, 
Oh, you don't know how many times I lay on my face and I cry out to God, do something in your church. Because we're a powerful entity when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When, when we're like Peter and the Holy Spirit falls on us, people want to come running to, to the church. But right now they are so just turned off by the church. The, the younger generations, they don't want to have anything to do. And whenever I ask them, why is it that you want to, don't have anything to do with the church? You know what they bring up every time? We've lost our voice because the things that we say and the things that we do don't match up. I cry out to God to restore our voice in this land. So how do you get your voice back? First thing, the first step is to humble ourselves. God, God, we're sorry. We, we allowed things to creep in. We gave ourselves over to some seducing spirits. And because of it, we, we've lost our voice in this nation, lost our voice in our community, lost our voice. You know, last Sunday night, in some ways, the church was getting a voice in this community whenever we were hosting the 40 churches that we're hosting. To humble ourselves, to humble yourself to your family and to say, I have not led this family. I have not been an example for this family. I have not done for you, my spouse, what God would have asked me to do. I've made some mistakes and I'm asking you to please forgive me. That's the first step in getting your voice back. You have to acknowledge that you lost it in the first place that there's been an offense that has silenced your voice. And then the second thing that we have to do is we have to repent. And the word repent isn't just saying, I'm sorry for doing it. The word repent means to stop, to change the way that we're living, to change the way we even think about how we live life. Sometimes we want, we want people to forgive us, but we won't change the way we're acting. Sometimes we, we want to have some benefits, but we don't want to pay the price to get them. There is a cost. And so the first step to get your voice back is we have to humble ourselves and to say we haven't done things the way that we should have done, whether it's individually or corporately. Then to be able to repent and to do things differently in the future. If you've had a mess up in the past, mess ups happen. And we, have to be, we need to be forgiven by God and by other people on those. But you'll never get your voice back if you continue doing it. So that's on us. The next thing is we have to spend some time with Jesus. Oh, and that's good. See, most of what I've been saying has been really challenging. But now I'm telling you so that's something really sweet and really good. We just have to spend time with Jesus. It said that they knew who the disciples were. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whenever you read those four, there were several times where it said that they could tell that these men had spent time with Jesus. Whenever they spoke, they said, we could tell that Jesus has influenced you. Because they had spent time with Jesus, it gave them a voice. You want to have a voice in your family, and your work? You want to have a voice in this community? You want to have a voice in this nation? Spend some time with Jesus. You spend some time with Jesus, you'll get a voice. Fourth step. I told you all the first one was to humble ourselves. Second one is to repent. Third one is to spend time with Jesus. And the next one kind of comes with spending time with Jesus. we got to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Because whenever His anointing comes on us, it changes everything. As I've been reading through the book of Judges for the last few weeks, there were some real knucklehead judges. They were not necessarily godly guys or women. They were human like all of us. But there was one thing that was very common through all of them. It said that when the Spirit fell on them, then they accomplished what they were supposed to do. If we're trying to go out there and live our life without the Holy Spirit falling on us, we're not going to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish. We have to have his anointing, whether it's our day to day decisions or something bigger. So so we need to humble ourselves. We need to repent. After we repent, we need to spend. Well, I mean, all of this needs to be with spending time with Jesus. We need to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And then here's one of the hard parts for all of us. Y'all, it takes time. It takes time. We want it now. It takes time. There may be some people that you've offended and you're, you've humbled yourself. You've asked for forgiveness. Matter of fact, some of you might have even repented and you're not doing it anymore, but it's still a problem. Sometimes it takes time. We, we can't just snap our fingers and all of a sudden have influence back and have our voice back. We've got to walk it out. 
Okay? So, so if, if it's not happening immediately, it's okay. Walk it out. Because time will always prove it. Time will always prove it. So whatever it is that you're going through, walk it out. Don't give up. Keep on going down the path because God will honor his word. He will honor his truth. And if you will walk it out, you will see the benefits come. So the question is, do you want to have your voice? Do you, do you want to have a voice when you pray? I'll just throw a little side note in there. One of the things that the word tells us robs us of our voice in prayer is unforgiveness. If you want to speak to the Lord, but you're carrying unforgiveness, it hurts your voice. That's scripture. And so if you want to be able to have God's ear, you're going to have to let go of the unforgiveness. Do you want to have a voice when you pray? Do you want to have a voice when you speak to your spouse, when you speak to your kids, when you speak to your friends and family? Do you want to have a voice at work? And most importantly, do you want to have a voice in the kingdom that we might see this nation turn? that we might see our, our city turn, that we might be able to affect the nations of the world. Then let's live as Christ lived. Let's be filled with his Holy Spirit. And if there are areas of compromise that we are living in that are hurting our voice, whether it be with our families, with our kids, work environment, whatever, let's ask the Lord to help us to humble ourselves and turn that we might get our voice back. Because when we get our voice back, can you imagine how powerful the church is and how powerful it will be whenever we get a hold of this message? Unstoppable. The great awakenings. Slavery came to an end. Do you know what happened right before it came to an end? In America, the second great awakening. And it stirred a group of people that began to pray and ask God to bring an end to the unholy institution of slavery in this nation. And the next thing you know is it began to spill out into the streets and spill out into the bars and it began to spill out all across the land because the Holy Spirit fell in a time known as the Great Awakening and people repented and they turned. A nation, a nation can be turned when the Holy Spirit falls. But God wants to pour it into his church. Where does the scripture say repentance starts where? In the house of the Lord. We as a church, not just Trinity, but we as a church, we need to get our voice back. And the way we get our voice back is by not looking like the world and by crying out to God to change our hearts and then watch what God does. I'm telling you, stand back and watch what God does. It's not over yet. The hope is still there. I still have faith that God is able to turn the hearts of this nation. Don't give up on her. Don't give up on the, on the fact that God can do a work in this nation and these people. But we've got to be ready to get our voice back. Is there anybody who wants to say amen? amen? Amen. Let's close our eyes and just ask the Lord right now, Holy Father. God, would you please show us where we're losing our influence and losing our voice? Lord, not just under our roofs, but like the sons of Sceva. They didn't have a voice in the spiritual realm. Lord, we want to have a voice. We want to have influence in the spiritual realms and in the natural realms. So, Father, we repent. We humble ourselves before you. Just as Samson did whenever he found himself bound and blind, he cried out and he said, God, would you touch me one more time? God, I'm asking you, would you touch the church of the United States of America one more time? Lord, and pour your Holy Spirit into us that we might accomplish what you've called us to do. But, Lord, it starts with us. Lord, turn our hearts. Break us of our places where we've been walking in compromise. And give us our voice back. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Be blessed.